Hello and welcome to a Believing Heart podcast, a podcast about video games and the like. I'm your host, Mario 8th. Find me across the internet at Mario 8th. I'm on the Twitters, I'm on the Tumblers, I'm on ggapp.io. If you'd like to track all the video games I'm playing, I'm on Co-Host, which maybe I'll post more on there. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the audio version on anchor.fm slash Mario 8th. Now, I don't know what happened. But I got a stick up my butt, and I played a whole bunch of video games in just the past week alone. And also, there was a whole bunch of news, so let's just jump right into it. So first, starting up, Trials of Death. The Mario Maker 1 level by Chain Chomp Brayden has finally been beaten after nearly seven years. So I saw this news on Twitter. Now in the article I've linked two different things, in the show notes I've linked two different things. An article by Patrick Klepik profiling this guy a few years ago and his Twitter account where he recently tweeted out my, or, or he tweeted out that on a recent Twitch stream, he beat his level. Now way, way back in Mario Maker 1, Brand Braden decided he wanted to make one of the hardest Mario levels ever, and he wanted to be able to beat it himself. And so back in, I think, 2017, yeah, when Patrick Klepek wrote about it, he had already spent 1,500 hours just trying to beat the level. And in that time, Mario Maker 1 has shut down its servers, so he can't even upload it to the official Mario Maker servers anymore. But a couple years ago, he said, eh, I still want to beat it. And then he's been trying every week for years now, and then just the other day on the 30th, I think it was the 30th, just the other day, on his Twitch stream, he finally beat it. And it, it's a remarkable achievement. The level looks incredibly hard. It's not time-coded too well, and his final run isn't uploaded to YouTube, at least as of now. But I looked up part of his final run in the Twitch stream, and it's, it's excellently choreographed, very, very practiced, an insanely difficult level to beat. And hell yeah, congratulations, dude, you did it. But if you want something easily playable, Metroid Mike 64 has put together what they're calling a Super Mario Bros. 5, a Mario Maker 2 pack of levels acting out as a spiritual successor to the original Marios, and I kind of want to check it out. I also saw this on Twitter the other day, I've linked the article from Polygon talking about it in the show notes, so that'll have all the links if you'd want to get to it later, like I might want to do as well, but this guy spent a while making 40 different courses, 8 full worlds, with a variety of different game styles where you play, and he, he set out with a goal, Mike set out with a goal to make Mario levels the same way that Nintendo makes Mario levels. And that sounds really interesting, because obviously, if you've played Mario Maker, there's generally two types. The type I just talked about, with Trials of Death, where it's a really hard Kaizo-type level, or like levels I would make, very beginning, easy, not well-designed levels. And Metroid Mike 64, Mike out here trying to make something playable as an actual Nintendo game is a really neat achievement. I definitely want to check it out uh, whenever I have the chance to. Also good news, Super Mario World makes up 24 of the courses, and that's my favorite art style, so that's also good. Continuing with Mario, it looks like they're making a sequel to the 1993 hit classic Super Mario Bros. This time, animated and starring Chris Pratt, of all people. And also, the reveal trailer is being presented as Nintendo Direct Thursday. So, Nintendo, earlier today, as I'm recording this on Tuesday, October 4th, they tweeted out the poster of the new Mario movie and said, Hey! There's a Nintendo Direct this Thursday at 1.05 p.m., which is an awkward time, but nevertheless, uh, they're revealing the trailer for it. And you know what? I'll be there at 1.05 in the afternoon to watch the new Super Mario trailer. Obviously, we don't know all that much about it. We know the voice cast, uh, most notably Chris Pratt as the titular Mario, which... Ugh... 
I guess we'll see how he does in a couple of days, but um, some of the other actors on the list are okay. I know in the poster we see what looks to be Captain Toad, or at least a toad with a whole bunch of stuff, and I guess you can assume that's Keegan Michael Key. We know Luigi's in it with Charlie Day, Bowser is Jack Black, Anya Taylor Joy is Peach, but I've never seen her in anything, so I can't really say how she'll do, but I mean, Peach doesn't really have much of a character anyway. Either way, I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm excited for it. I'm, I don't know if I'm excited for the movie, but I am excited to watch the trailer, if that makes any sense. I just want to see what this movie is going to be. As far as the poster, though, it looks brilliant. I really like how they've integrated the level design and level artifacts from the various different Mario games and made it seem like something a little bit more. Um, the link's in the poster, but you'll notice Peach's castle is way up on the, up on the hill. There's floating blocks. A lot of them look like the platforming blocks, and the hills look like the Mario hills. And then up in the forefront, the first thing I noticed was my favorite bitty buddies are just walking along down the row with a bunch of different toads. And then there's pea switches and music blocks from Mario 3 in an antiques shop. And there's a cheap sheep shop over there. I don't know what any of this is going to be. I don't know how much any of it's going to actually matter and just be background things to notice. But hey, I like the Super Mario. Despite its many, many, many flaws, I like the original Mario Bros. live action movie. And despite them making Mario's butt really small for some reason, I mean, in the games, he's got a dump truck, but in this poster, he doesn't. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with this property in a feature film. Speaking of remakes, Sony is continuing in its questionable effort to get more money by remaking PS4 games that are entirely playable on PS5. Horizon Zero Dawn is being remade for PS5 for money reasons. So they just did this. Like it released a few weeks ago now with The Last of Us Part 1 remake which from all I've heard really didn't need to happen. Like they didn't change the game all that much at all. They didn't even integrate the DLC. They just improved the gameplay a little bit and improved the, and quote unquote, improved the graphics. I don't know, I played The Last of Us, it's not my favorite game by any means, but it looked pretty good when I played the PS4 remaster version on a base PS4, and they, I, I don't, the screenshots they shared of the graphic improvements didn't look like improvements to me, whatever. I imagine I'll have largely the same opinion about Horizon Zero Dawn. I did like Zero, I just finished playing all of Zero Dawn, twice through for 100% completion trophy purposes, and so hearing a remake is coming is like, oh, okay, I'll play it in a decade, I guess, but it's there, it's coming, I guess, the, the rumors are about, it seems to have been corroborated by multiple sources, so it really seems like they're doing it, and obviously Sony saw how well The Last of Us sold it, presumably, and they're like, hey, I bet this'll be easy cash, we already have all the models from Horizon Forbidden West, those already look good, just improve the graphics a little bit, maybe improve the gameplay. I think they also said something about improving the physics, and hey, we'll sell it for 70 bucks, and we'll make a whole lot more money off of this game that's already pretty much done. And again, Horizon Zero Dawn isn't my favorite game. I'm gonna play uh, Forbidden West, that's what it's called pretty soon, but I really I really don't need a remake of the first one. It already looked pretty darn good. I'm playing the PS4 version on a PS5, and it looks and plays really good accordingly. It doesn't need a remake. It already looks great. Like, yeah, I guess it could look a little bit better, but I don't know. I don't, it doesn't need it, but I mean, The Last of Us also didn't need it. And Sony knows it doesn't need it, Sony just wants the money, because at the end of the day, these businesses, these businesses are about making money, and Sony wants to get better at that. And uh, they look at Nintendo, and almost every Wii U game has now been re-released on Switch, many of which I have purchased myself, and they're thinking, we could probably do that too. And they are. The only difference being the Wii U is not compatible with Switch 
and the the Switch is not backwards compatible for Wii U, so it, that makes a little bit more sense why it's been ported. Also, the Wii U sold terribly, whereas the PS4 won the last generation, so uh, they want money, and that's that's the end of the argument. They want money, and they're gonna make that money any way they can. And, the Last of Us sold so well, they're only assuming Horizon Zero Dawn will also sell well. But while some are remade, others are let go. RIP Stadia. I used you once. So Google Stadia is going to end and shut down its service January 18th, 2023. And other than being completely inevitable, Something that people predicted way back when Google Stadia was first announced all those years ago. Uh, humorously, they in the I think it was an E3 presentation. They had they lined the streets up to the Google Stadia announcement with the uh, a ET for the Atari 2600, the game that crashed the video game market back then. They put the Virtual Boy, a uh, failed Nintendo console. And there was a third thing they had that also was bad. Maybe it was the Dreamcast. Yeah, it was the Dreamcast, the uh, this thing that failed Sega as a console maker. And now Google Stadia is following in that same example. Now, for all intents and purposes, if you have a good internet connection, I bet Stadia worked pretty well. But it had one really nasty thing going after it. It was put out by Google. And Google kind of sucks at supporting its own services that are not YouTube or Maps or Gmail or actual Google. Um, and so Stadia was kind of set up to fail. They just didn't get enough backing right at the start. And then they stopped developing games, laid off a bunch of people. And e there are even games that are scheduled to come out soon that the developers weren't even alerted about that Stadia was shutting down. So now, no one knows what's going to happen to these developers. Are they still going to get paid? Are their games going to be able to come out? That's hard to say right now because Stadia's shutting down and they didn't communicate it well enough. But on the other hand, and, and that sucks because developers should get paid. But on the other hand... I wasn't really expecting much from Google Stadia anyway. As I mentioned at the top, I've played Stadia once. I booted it up the free trial on my computer, tried to play just a puzzle game, and my internet was so bad, even the puzzle game was so incredibly laggy, I couldn't even play it. And so I immediately cancelled the subscription and never thought about it again, up until I got an email a couple days ago also announcing this Stadia, the Stadia closure, and I thought that was a little bit funny. Also on the bright side, Google Stadia is refunding all purchases to people who bought anything on it, and that's good. None of the other console developers have done that, so at least Google is giving the money back to the players if it's still questionable whether they'll go they're going to be giving money to the developers who still have games coming out. In oh wow, this really sucks news, the business people behind ZA-UM, or ZAUM, not sure how to pronounce that, the studio who made Disco Elysium, a game I really want to play and have only heard amazing things about, the business, the business people behind ZAUM have pushed out the three main creatives behind the creation of Disco Elysium. And this was announced the other day through a tweet, I want to say, and I'm quoting um, from the Martin Lugia who wrote this. I, Martin Luiga, a founding member of the Secretary of Zaum Cultural Association, as well as the assembler of most of the core team, am hereby dissolving the Zaum Cultural Association. Not to be confused with the Zaum Company, on which the subject I would note that neither Kurvitz, Hinpier, nor Rostov are working there since the end of last year, and their leaving the company was involuntary. So basically what he's saying is the creatives behind one of the best written games, possibly ever from what I hear, have been pushed out by the business people so the business people can make more money. And that is an absolute shame. I've even started seeing people online being like, yeah, 
People who worked on this game don't even make money off of it anymore, it's all going to the business folks who didn't do anything. And so yeah, pirate the game, the people who actually made it what it is, don't benefit by you buying it anymore, so just pirate it. And you almost never see that type of argument get pushed around. And it's, it's such a bummer, because I was really excited for this game when I would eventually get around to playing it, and turns out if I even bought it this year, my money wouldn't have been going to the people who made it what it was, and that sucks, and capitalism sucks. And I haven't played it, but I know there's an irony. The, uh, the irony is that the game is also kind of about how capitalism sucks and it corrupts people, and the fact that it also happened to the business people behind the game is just... Mwah, chef's kiss... Chef's kiss pile of garbage. And so my heart and thoughts out to the developers. Hopefully they land on their feet. I bet they will. <laughs> Disco Elysium is one of the most highly rated games I've ever seen. Uh, hopefully they can land on their feet. That being said, there is also like a... S sequel that has been rumored there is a television show adaptation and i i would say i would advise to keep away from that with uh with all your might don't hate watch it don't hate buy it don't hate consume it don't even hate talk about it just ignore it because we don't want these terrible people who pushed out the best part of the company to get more of your money and in strange gaming press news, the bad wiki site Fandom has just acquired a bunch of different sites, including the only one from the list I watch, Giant Bomb. So this came as a surprise recently. Um, I, I listen to the Giant Bomb cast every week, or uh, usually a week late or two weeks late at this point. I'm a little behind on podcasts, but still, I really like Giant Bomb. I like the people there. They got bought out by Red Venture very recently. In, in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic. And now, only uh, less than a couple of years later, they've been bought out by Fandom. Now, that's the first strange thing. Fandom? The people who make made the bad wiki sites that everyone uses? Yeah, I guess so. Um, they bought out... They now have a, cor a huge corporate bundle of, from the image they posted out, GameSpot, Metacritic, TV Guide... Fanatical, Screen Junkies, Game Facts, Giant Bomb, Cord Cutters, and Comic Vine. And they were also quoted as saying that games are a big part of their wiki sites. A lot of gamers use fandom. And so it does make sense for them to expand into that with GameSpot. And they didn't mention it, but also Giant Bomb and Game Facts and all the other video game stuff. It's just weird. Now, the only one I have connections with is seeing people on Twitter being like, hey, this is a good thing that we're being bought out by fandom. Of course, that they also said that when Red Ventures bought them out, albeit a different group of people at the time, and well, look what happened. The same people who said, like, uh, pointing specifically at Jeff Gersman, Jeff Gersman was saying, yeah, the Red Venture acquisition is good. And a year later, he's gone and started his own thing. So what does this actually mean for Giant Bomb? It's hard to say. What does it mean for any of these? It's hard to say. I hope I hope everyone manages to keep their job. So far, it seems like they have kept it. But it's it's still scary, especially with stuff like Fanbyte being killed, G4TV had a bunch of pe uh, folks laid off. Um, it, it's a tumultuous time for this industry, and... Yeah. I don't have a closing sentence. It's a tumultuous time. Anyway, that is all the news articles I pulled. Again, everything is can be found in the show notes. I have links to all the articles I talked about. Now, let's move on to what I've been doing. As I mentioned at the top, I played so many video games. So, okay. In the past week, I played a whole lot of games. I completed the Splatoon 2 Octo expansion, beat the Toem DLC, fully completed Tunic start to finish, and started and got almost halfway through Splatoon 3's single player. I don't know what it was, maybe I just really had the drive to play a lot of video games, and all of these are a little bit shorter. The Toem DLC was like an hour, Splatoon Octo expansion I was mostly done with, Tunic uh, I finished over the course of two days, and that's only like 18 hours I think it took, but still, I, I really played through these games. 
or maybe I was just in a depressive funk where the only thing I could do was sit down and play games to completion, who can say? Anyway, I want to talk about a bit each of them. First, let's go into Splatoon 2's DLC, Octo Expansion. My goodness, the DLC was amazing. Now, they, now I enjoyed the main campaign of the single player. The levels were pretty well put together. I liked the dialogue, mostly from Marie, but Sheldon was there too, and the bosses were pretty fun. But the completion um, requirements really bugged me. And then when I loaded up uh, the DLC, the Octo Expansion, so many of my complaints were immediately resolved. The way that there were only up to three weapons per level that you would have to complete it in, all the levels were a lot shorter, the UI was really clean to just travel and check each of the levels was completed. It was such, it was such a fun experience, a fun and short, and I only had a couple issues with this some levels later on. And it, it was really fun, and then I beat the game, and the final levels, and the final boss is just amazing. It is, oh, I loved it. I love the final, I love all the characterization you got of Captain Cuttlefish and Pearl and Marina. Playing through with Pearl and Marina has made me real has made me really miss them in Splatoon 3, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, but such good characterization of all these characters. The levels are so good, even the longer levels at the end post or end game section, and then the final boss had some amazing cues to like the multiplayer game in ways that I find so enjoyable. And the music, fantastic. Just great music all around, really great game. I, I couldn't have liked the Splatoon 2 Octo expansion any more. And I, I wrote it last, but uh, I'll just jump right into Splatoon 3 because that makes a little bit more sense. And I'm so happy Splatoon 3 has taken all the right lessons. It has basically the same exact level structure as the Octo expansion, but now instead of choosing it from the tunnel, the, the list, that the Octo Expansion has, now it's more in an open world like Splatoon 2, where you track down different areas of the level. They introduced this fuzzy slime where you have to have your little buddy and spend the currency, the eggs, I think, the fish eggs, to get rid of it so you can traverse more of the level. And one, I've been having a great time exploring this level. Two, I love little buddy, the little guy. With my whole heart, I would die for him. He's amazing. I love him. Um, and three, all the levels are just as good as they were in the Octo expansion. They're all short. You still only have to beat him a maximum of three times for completion. And it goes by so snappy. I'm, I'm really having a great time. Plus, the dialogue is also really good. Like, the, the introduction, they trick you into thinking it's going to be a retread of the Splatoon 1 and Splatoon 2 main campaign, where Captain Cuttlefish hires you to get back the zap fish with the little with the little guys in between each level, and then that quickly gets thrown out for the actual campaign, which I thought was really funny. Um, but now we get to learn more about Callie and Marie, and then the Agent 3 from Splatoon 1 is back, and now titled The Captain, and they have a really fun gag where they don't talk at all, except to Callie and Marie, and then Callie and Marie sometimes tell you what they say. I'm having a really good time with it. It makes me sad that I never bought Splatoon 1 for the Wii U. I played it a little bit, a couple online matches at a friend's at the time, but... I never did the campaign, and now I kind of wish I had. I think I've picked up the general gist of it through the Splatoon 2 and Octo expansion campaigns, but I, I do wish I had just a little bit more context with that, but I won't, because I'm not going to buy it. It's the Wii U game. I guess I do have my Wii U set up, but whatever. I'm really enjoying Splatoon 3. I also am enjoying the multiplayer if I would ever go back to play it, but I think I'm going to just rush through the campaign. I'm having a real good time with it. So after I beat Octo Expansion, I did jump back in to play the Toem DLC. Now if you don't know, Toem is a little game where you control a little guy in this really fun isometric type um, level-based, area-based, where you take pictures 
to solve puzzles for different people. And all the characters are little 2D sprites a la Paper Mario. And each island is just, each section of the map is like a little island where you can rotate the camera in multiple different directions and take pictures of things and then walk into a different area and take pictures there. I had a real good time, I played it earlier last year. Yeah, early in 2021 and the DLC came out just recently and I, they put out a new island, a new area for you to explore. And it was really fun. I had a great time with it. The puzzles were good. The world, the new area was the biggest world they'd put out. There was a lot of heart put into it. The ending was really touching. And then it had a really nice message at the end from the actual creators being like, thank you so much for playing. And I was like, no, thank you for making such a good game. And I, mo and I completed the game and had a good time with it. But then... I fell into a bug and I looked on their Twitter account and they've talked about the bug and they're working on it. They just posted an update today. It's like, hey, uh, can you send us screenshots of the bug so we can try to work on it a little more? I've fallen into an infinite load glitch where I have two more achievements and I think I know how to do at least one of the achievements. I'll figure out the other one pretty soon, but I, I can't I can't load the game. I start up the game and it just loads forever and ever and I can't. I can't get in to actually do it, and it, that's a bummer. And so on ggf.io, I've just left it in playing until I get the update. Toem has been- the infinite load glitch has been fixed, go ahead and play it, but uh, other than the glitch, it's a really cute game. I think it- if it was, or currently is, free on a PlayStation Plus, so if you have that, go and get it now. Speaking of PlayStation Plus, um, if you have Deathloop, and I think there's even crossplay now, so if you just have Deathloop, please help me with the multiplayer trophies. Please. That's another one that's on my permanent playing list because I have two more trophies I want after having completed everything else. And I will, I cannot sleep until I get both, either of these games completed. Anyway, last game I played was Tunic. I have been looking forward to Tunic for so long, like I was so excited, vibrating when it came out for Xbox a few months ago, but I waited. I thought, it's on PC, I could play it on PC, but the last time this happened, I bought it on PC, and then like a month later, it was announced for PlayStation, and I want those shiny trophies, darn it, and so I waited, and I waited. And then it was announced for September 27th, and I was like, heck yeah, I'm gonna play Tunic on my PlayStation and get a shiny platinum trophy. And then I finally bought it the other day, right after <laughs> right after I beat Splatoon 2 Octo expansion, I think I bought it, and then I played through uh, Toem, and then I started up Tunic. And it's a great game. There were so many aspects of it I really liked. So I loved the exploration aspect of it. The combat wasn't my favorite and there's only one uh, portion of the game at the very end that made me mad. Everything else I absolutely adored. The game looks beautiful. The music is fantastic. It has a really good piano in it and that's kind of all it takes for me to think a soundtrack is fantastic, but whatever. And I completed it. I fully completed this game in two days. I just really played through it. And it felt almost weird being so excited for this game and then being done with it so quickly. Either way, I and uh, actually yesterday I forced myself to finally start writing a new script. Now with Super Mario in review every other Saturday on Mario on youtube.com slash Mario 8th, I've been posting Mario in reviews for a while now and I will continue up through March. And so I haven't written a script since I finished Odyssey's way a while ago now. Um, and so it, I'm, I'm a little rusty writing scripts, but I, so I finally forced myself. I wrote just a rough-ish outline, some lines that I think can get implemented in the main script, but kind of just put down some notes of what I want to write about later on. I'm going to make a script. Will it come out soon? Probably not. This feels like it'll come out after Mario in Review finishes, but eh. What's a whole year late to the Tunic discussion? Anyway, that is all- oh! Wait, not quite. I've also been watching Andor, which isn't a video game, but it is a show I'm really enjoying. 
Just the way that they are exploring this world, they're making it feel real, they're making the Empire feel truly oppressive, everything feels tactile. Like in the latest episode, there's a map built by some Republic insurgences, and it's made with like actual, it's an actual model, it's not a holographic map because these people don't have the money for a holographic map, so it's just a model made with sticks and grass and it looks so tactile and they make a point of saying hey I have to pick up this and put it over here to show some more and I'm really I'm really enjoying this show on a tactile level and on a character level it's also just as good I, I care about Andor I care about all the characters he he's interacting with and I'm really excited to see where the show goes could it bomb in the next season or the ne later half of this season who knows but for now I'm loving it Anyway, that was it for a Believing Heart podcast. Again, you can follow me on all my socials, links in the show notes. And if you'd like, leave a rating on this potted cast. You can leave it on YouTube with a thumbs up and maybe a comment, or you can leave it on podcast services. I know Apple really incentivizes reviews if you'd like. Um, and uh, hey, sub to, the, sub to the feed, sub to my YouTube, and... Uh, I hope you had a good time. Thank you for listening, and I will see you next time.